All right. Well, we're excited about this new series, and we're going to be talking about relationships, how we can make them better. And so what I want to talk about here before I get started is just to encourage you, look, when, when you go through a, a teaching series like this, it's really tempting to look back and try to evaluate you know, all the relationships you've ever had. And, and so it can get a little overwhelming. So I don't want you to do that. What I want you to do is think forward. I want you to think about the present relationships you have right now and the hope of the reconnections and all that God wants to do through your life. So we're going to be talking about this. Is, this is pretty important stuff. And it's not just about building friendships and, and whatnot. What we, we actually learn is that all of, excuse me, I'm sorry, that all of life is based on relationships. You know, you're born into this world, and the next thing you know, we're connecting with people, our mom or dad, our brothers, sisters, other people. And, and one of the things that we learn about relationships is we're not really that well equipped to know how to do it. And so as a result, we kind of stumble in and out of relationships, and, and, and we, we learn certain things about ourselves, and, it, and it's a bit of a challenge, and we don't always do really well. And so <clears throat> what we want to do over the next several weeks, and this is going to be a four-week uh, series, so starting today and then three more uh, weekends, and I'm going to cover seven different principles. So we're going to start with one, and then we'll do two per week after that in order to cover the whole series. This is based on, and I'm gathering some of this information from a book called Building Successful Relationships by Michael Fletcher, my pastor. He wrote this book several years ago. You can actually find a copy of it in our bookstore. But it is, it's very practical. It's very down to earth, and it really cuts right to the heart of what really helps to build the kind of relation, relationships that will bring us joy, that will bring us peace. When we understand that it is about relationships, that determines our real joy in this world, then it really makes sense that we spend a little more time kind of learning about how that works, how it's going to affect our marriage, how it will affect our coworkers and the people that we can, the friendships that we have, even more so within the church. You know, one of the temptations for people these days is the moment we get hurt, we withdraw. And all of us have had relationships like that. We've had good ones and we've had some bad ones. We've had some relationships that, that didn't end real well, and we might call them estranged or broken relationships even to this day. So the success or failure of relationships really directly affects the quality of this life we live. You know, we know money can't buy it, you know? We learn that real quickly, that money can't buy friendship, can't buy true love. And you can have lots of money, but it doesn't make you ultimately happy because we are designed, folks, by design, to be able to connect with people. God made us that way. You know, you've heard of feral relationships. You know, I mean, you, not feral relationships, but feral people. In other words, people that grow up or, or, or uh, uh, grow up in a situation where they have no other connection with human beings, they're actually uh, underdeveloped. Parts of their brain does not even develop. They've done studies on this. So we are, by nature, designed to connect with other people. And so it's so important when we think in those terms, and does God have a solution for us? He absolutely does. We can look to Scripture to help us refine and build and equip ourselves with the kind of knowledge, the kind of truth that will help us live to the best of our ability, to, but to walk in the grace of God in these ways. So we've had these success and failures We've had that one friend that we enjoyed growing up with and a coworker that we just clicked with, you know, a son or a daughter that, you know, the, the, the connection and the closeness. But we've also had experiences with those, those relationships drifting too. And sometimes we don't always wonder why. Sometimes it's just a matter of, of, of other things we're going to talk about in this series. But we want to know, how do we make these things grow? How do we make them life-giving? We're going to look at that. So these principles that we're going to learn are kind of neat because they're not only can apply to marriage and friendships, but they can apply to business relationships as well. Even as a boss, even as, as a person who's leading other people in, in a situation, you can take these. They're transferable to almost any interpersonal type situation you might find. So what we're going to do is we're going to cover one profound truth with seven different applications. So let's, let's talk about that one profound truth. First of all, let's talk about really what, we're, what, what this is all about. Folks, we have, the Bible talks about us having a heart. The Bible talks about, and it's not the physical pump that you have on the inside. It is, really, another word is for is our soul. 
But let's look at the heart. When we say, it, it hurt my heart, you broke my heart, it fills my heart. What are we really talking about there? We're talking about our soul. We're talking about our mind, our will, our, and our emotions. It is the seat of our emotions. It really makes up who we are. You know, the Bible teaches that we are tripart beings. In other words, we're spirit, we're soul, and we're bodies. So we're spirit. That's the eternal part of who we are that lives forever. And it is only, as Scripture says, we're born dead in our trespasses and sins. Well, I'm alive. I'm breathing in and out, and I've got a personality. What part of me is dead? Well, it's your spirit. Your spirit is, is, needs to be brought to life through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And then, but your soul is this heart. It is, uh, it is the, the essence of who we are, personality. And so, uh, again, you know, when we think about the heart, the Bible teaches us in Proverbs chapter 4. Now, Proverbs is an awesome book. It begins talking about that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And so it's laying that foundation. But then chapter 4 comes along and boom, hits us with a profound truth. And it says this, that we should guard our hearts, for it is the wellspring of life. It says that we should guard it with all diligence. In other words, in, in, in one of the, the, the phrase that it uses is, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. So let's look at that just for a minute. It's the wellspring of life. It means that my heart, since it is the seed of my emotions, my passions, my joy, my peace, my depression, my str- all of it happens in here. That's why we should guard it. And we should, be very, we, should, we should stand diligently at the entrance to my soul. And so we're going to get into that a little bit more as, as to why that's so important. But So let's, let's just use a little illustration to kind of show you kind of the, the, uh, the importance of this. So, you know, at Christmas time, we just finished that up. And some of you perhaps, when maybe you like gathering ornaments that are like uh, heirloom uh, ornaments. And some of those, if they're old, they're really delicate. You've noticed that as in time they get old and they get fragile. And so you got them all wrapped up with that tissue paper and you got them hidden sometimes in its own separate box and it's marked. And so, you know, you're pulling them out and you open the box carefully and you pull the tape paper off and you pull that thing out. And maybe you hand it to your son or your daughter or somebody and you say, Hey, hey, hey be careful, be careful with that. It's very delicate. It's very fragile. And so what are you, you're very careful who you're giving that to, right? It's not like you got somebody running through the room that's been eating ribs with their fingers and you say, here, you know, and pfft. you're going to be really careful who you give that ornament to, aren't you? Well, that's exactly like our hearts. Our hearts are something very delicate, something very fragile. And if we think of it in those terms, that it, the Bible is telling us, be very, very careful. Why? Because it is the seed of our emotions, because it is what where life is, and that real life is lived. Matter of fact, when my heart is filled with joy and peace, nothing is any better. You, I mean, I tell you what, it doesn't matter what your real circumstances are, you're good. But all of us knows when you're down, your heart is downcast and you're struggling and you're, you're not full of hope. The heart is dry, isn't it? And, and, and so it doesn't matter what your circumstances are, you still can't get out of that pit. And so that's why the Bible's saying, look, you are responsible for that heart. And once we begin to realize that, then we can kind of go, okay, well, then what do I need to in there? How do, I, how do I guard my heart? What are some of the, the how do I diligently guard this thing? Is there, what does the Bible, the Bible say about that? Well, we're going to get into it. And what we learn, though, with this illustration is that no one is safe when it comes to your heart. Because, you know, we learn often the hard way that not everybody is going to be delicate with our heart, are they? We give it to them, you know, carefully. We even tell them, please don't break my heart. But they may drop it accidentally. They may even throw it up against the wall in what we have experienced. So one of the real challenges is obviously knowing who to give that heart to. And so that's why it's saying, look, be really careful with that because out of it is the wellsprings of life. Out of it will come your joy, your peace. It will, so many things will control your life and in, in many ways how you will enjoy the rest of your destiny, how you will be able to pursue your, your purpose. So we've had those experiences. We essentially give them the doorway. When we give someone our heart, what we're saying is you have full access. You have full access to me. And so what happens is, is it, it's 
really like we are no longer guarding that. They, they're in. And when they're in, what they do to the rest of your house, what they do to the rest of the delicate parts of your nature and of your, of your being is, is, you know, they're at it. And you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you've, you've lived any time at all, you've had friendships at any level, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We've all had a very good friend. Sometimes we've had some bad friends. There are people that we wouldn't say, you called yourself my friend? We've had that. And so one of the things you could say, well, why do people open their hearts? Well, sometimes we're just naive. Sometimes we just, maybe we're taught love, 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 and, and taught to just rest, you know, let people in only to find out, wow, that wasn't too smart. And then on the other hand, we might have been taught never trust a soul. Don't ever let anybody into your heart because they're going to hurt you. Both of those extremes are wrong. The truth is, people, if you want to enjoy this life, if you want to have you know, the kind of life that, that it, it, it's going to be full of, of joy and peace and, and opportunity and the whole nine yards, it's got to involve people. You're by design. God made you to have those relationships. And so whew, this is tough. It means it's a risk, isn't it? Shoot, they make movies about all this stuff. And what we begin to realize is that, wow, that's so true. You know, you know, sharing with my children, I say, look, man, when it is, it is a risk. It is a risk when you decide to, to open your heart to someone now up. But the key is being very, very careful as to when to open that heart, how you open that heart, and your basic understanding of what you're actually doing. And that's what we're going to really do over these next weeks is, is to just find out what is it that I'm doing. And we're also going to talk about how there are different levels. You know, a stranger, you're not going to walk up and just say, okay, here, look, let me just tell you everything I've ever done and who I am and right down to the deepest part of my deepest, innest secrets. You're not going to tell that to a stranger. But you know what? People do that all the time. And why do they do that all the time? It's because we have such a need for love. We have such a need to be connected to people that what we, it's just like, just throw my whole card, everything out there. And again, it may be because of what we've been taught. It might be just, again, wrong thinking, wrong teaching, whatever. But the truth is, we become awkward at this thing, and we don't have to be. We don't have to be. You know, we begin this journey as young people, as, as, as children. You know, I, as a matter of fact, I just think of Leeson. Remember when Leeson was up there at the Christmas videos? And he goes, it's like that friend that you really want to be your friend. You know, he's not doing his R's just quite right. And I mean, you just fall in love with a little guy. You just want to say, I'll be your friend, Leeson. I'll be it. I promise. He's, how old is Leeson? I went four, five. It starts from the cradle, people, that we want people to love us. We want friendships. We want to connect. Why? Because God made us to do that. He designed us to do that. So that's why we often get hurt, because we don't always know how to do that. And, and again, learning the levels of people that have earned that place. So there's acquaintances. There's, there's, there's other, other things that, that, uh, that we've put in our materials, haven't we, Tammy? You know, just talking about people that... that have earned that place of trust in intimacy levels. I mean, you know, so you don't give all your heart to a stranger, but you are going to give your heart all the way to the people who by covenant you're supposed to give it to. You know, Facebook has really kind of screwed this whole thing up too. MySpace and Sim World, you know, that game. We, we are now, because we have, uh, we kind of messed this whole thing up that we now are trying to live in the AI world. That's another example, another proof that we really want to be close to people. And so what we do is we create these games to enjoy a perfect world of human connections, except it's all fake. I goofed around with that little Sim City one time. I didn't even play it a few days before I realized this is stupid. What, what's going on here? and trying to make yourself look handsome, and trying to make you look like that, and that you're gathering friends in this room, and you walk in because... I'm just going, this is a little sick, but I'm sorry. I mean, you know, if you're into that game, I'm not, I'm not down on you. I'm just saying, you might want to move on from that, you know. We offer the real thing here, you know. Anyway, so... Um, and it's Facebook. And then what we want to do is we want to jump on the Facebook thing, right? And we want to get on there. We start writing, and, and we want to connect. And, and man, have you all figured out real quickly that that's a violent world? <laughs> 
Facebook. I get on there and share an opinion. Hey, yeah, I really, I really think this, that, or the other thing. Whoa. Within the hour, you got 20 people hacking on you big time hard. They don't even know you. Well, you're an idiot. Really? How about I meet you out on the corner out here in about 10 minutes, bro? I'll show you who's the idiot. You know? I mean, very quickly you begin to realize, gosh, man, this, is, this world's out of control. Yeah. Why? Because we need soul to soul. We need eye to eye. You can't tell a person's heart when they're sitting there typing on that. You can't tell what their heart is. You've got to know their heart. You know, truth without love, without heart, sometimes can be a very brutal thing. Boy, did I learn that. You have too, I'm sure. So, folks, this is where we are. Guarding our heart is really the challenge. And God has made us. You may say, well, how many people are supposed to get in there, Pastor David? Lots. We are, by design, endless amounts of people that we can connect with. And that's pretty cool, isn't it? That we can have a lot of friends. Now, you, may, you're not, you only got 24 hours in a day, and you can only have so many friends at that level, and that's the key. Now, if we're going after the Scripture, God has designed us. If we go right back to the, back to the, you know, the beginning, God looked at Adam and said, it's good for him not to be alone, so he created him a helpmate, gave him a wife. And so in its very foundation of human beings, we know we've been designed to have that kind of intimacy at that level. And it's reserved only for that. And so it's going to be very tempting for me to jump into a marriage seminar, and I can't. Because we need to back up, because this, this is universal truths. But man, nowhere do you find this stuff really working at its utmost. And its clarity is in marriage. And that's Bible, Ephesians chapter 5. So the most important thing in all of this, folks, is diligence. There's many skills in life, many professions. But I'll tell you what, the one that you'll never be disappointed in having The one that will never let you down in whatever vocation you do is your ability to improve in guarding your heart, knowing how to give your heart, and how to maintain your heart in the relationships that God gives you. One profound truth, many different applications. So let's start with the first one. Let's talk about love. You know, we write songs about love. We have movies about love. Love is a many splendored thing, right? Love is pretty awesome, except not many of us really know what it is. It's just a word. So for for us to be able to have relationships, true, good, deep relationships, we need to study this word love. We need to really know what it is because the truth is we've been all kind of sold a bill of goods. We've all been kind of, and and, and look, there's there's nothing wrong with, with our understanding of love because the, the truth of the matter is, it, it's how we respond. It's, it's what's been given to us. It's, it, it's, it's our first response to it. We need God to help us understand the fullness of it. We'll get to that. But is love just an emotion? You know, and, and if we think about it, that's really, at its heart, that's what we think. We think love is an emotion. And we think, well, I'm in love with you. Well, for most human beings, what that means is I feel love for you right now. Okay. So that, that's what we think. Is it an emotion? No, no. The Bible really teaches that love comes as a result. Or, or rather, love produces emotions. True love. Come back to, to that. See, when emotion... See, let's make the case as to why emotion is not real love. See, when we focus on just emotion, what it really is is very selfish-focused. It's, it's about me. As long as I'm feeling in love with you, then this thing keeps going down the road. As long as you're meeting my needs, as long as, you know, the feelings are there, I'm good. Well, let me show you an example of this. You know, in marriage, can't help but use it. You know, Andrew and I, we got married. Well, before that, you know, I remember the, I remember the first day I looked at Andrew and just said, wow, this, this little girl, I want her. She's my babe. And I remember, you know, going to her dad and talking to him, and, and all of a sudden, chemical things start going inside of me. I actually lost my mind. And I found this to be scientifically true. I was not thinking straight. I'm, I had to work at UPS. I'm getting up. I mean, I'm finishing school, and I'm jumping in the car, driving to Greensboro from Fayetteville 
spending, having dinner with her, hanging out, going to a movie. And I got to be back by 2.30. I'm not thinking straight, folks, because I'm in love with this girl. And chemical stuff is taking over my brain. And, and, it, and it, what I've since discovered is this lasts about two years. About two years. That your body begins to produce these endorphins. It produces all of this stuff in order to make it stick. It's, it's, it's by design. And so Andrew and I, we're just, we're just madly in love. And it's all, she's my sun, my moon, my sunlit stars. So after two years, all of a sudden, I, you know, if I had to do that again, he'd be like, honey, do you think I could... Come in the morning, get a, get a good night's sleep. I mean, I love you and all, but I think I'm awake. I got the job and all. See, it settles back into something else. The problem is we have then defined what love is, is based on just that chemical response. And so it's, it's selfish motivated. And, and even at that point, it's not so much that. It's just by design what God put inside me. But we can't say, that's not it. It just passed by. Well, is it an emotion? Is it, a, is it an urge? Is it a drive? Uh, no, not real love. Let's go deeper. When emotion is the focus, it ceases being real love. True love exists even without emotion. Whew. Does that blow up your world? Does that change all your love songs? You know? Does that change how you look at movies? Well, it should, because most of what is fed to us is not a lie. It's just only about that deep. It's not giving us the full picture. And the problem is we then become somewhat trained, if not, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of yeah, we're trained to think that that's what love is supposed to be. And so when we don't feel all those, 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 those endorphins, when we don't feel like, you know, I'm, you know, I mean, there are times now where Andrea's going to look at me and just say, honey, I just need you to go to work and just get out of my life for about eight hours, okay? <laughs> love you, right? And that's the way we understand that. But what we find is that love is so much deeper. Let's keep going. So, what, what do we perceive as love? Well, there's infatuation. And that usually hits us when we're young because we're just beginning to discover. But it's selfish at its focus. And so we're in love with the idea of love. We're in love with, wow, this is a pretty cool, cool idea that you want to write letters to me, that you want to come and see me, that you might even want to kiss me. And this might even be kind of more of a female thing as opposed to a male thing, but maybe not. But the whole idea is that infatuation is being in love with love and the idea, and it's awakening. Song of Solomon talks about that. It says, do not awaken love until it's time. That's a wisdom book. And what it's trying to tell us is that, once again, guarding your heart. But man, nothing like the love of a human being that, that results in the connecting of two heart, hearts forever should, <laughs> nothing else should be more guarded and carefully done than that. And that's what the whole story of, of that book is about. But infatuation, again, it's selfish at its core. Then we have lust, the physical. We use lust to describe, you know, it's, it's negative. But really, we're talking about sexual love without commitment. We're talking sexual love outside the, the bounds of, of what it was created for in the context of marriage. And so when, so again, what it is, it's just selfish. It's, it's selfish motivated. What can you do to please me? And so as a result, that is the drive. That's what makes that happen. And so as long as I'm feeling, I mean, we're all adults here, as long as I'm feeling aroused, as long as I'm feeling this, then I feel, quote, unquote, love. Mm, not so much. Because guess what? That goes away. Comes and goes. And if we base all of our life on that, then whew, that's no way to live, which might explain a lot of broken relationships. It might. Conditional need. I will love you as long as you meet my needs. And again, this is selfish at its core. See, true love centers on unconditional giving. Let's look at the Greek for a moment. You've heard this before, but let's just, just, just go over it again real briefly. So three words in the Greek. Our understanding, the English understanding of love is very one-dimensional, even though we do have other words to describe the parts of, of what we know as biblical love. But still, love is the, is the, the, is the do-all, you know, throw in all for us. Just that one, that four-letter word, love. We put so much into that. But in the Bible, it is actually interpreted as love, but it's three different Greek words, possibly even four. But let's look at the three. Phileo, 
Phileo is friendship love. That is love that dwells in the soul. That is how we connect soul to soul. But it's still only one dimension. And it, and, it, and it specifically says it's the kind of love that I might feel for a friend, how I might feel about Kenny, about how I'd feel about any friend that I have. You know, it's going to be brotherly love, Philadelphia. That's where we get that. And so it's, it's through the soul. It's emotional, yes. Has it got commitment? Yes. But it is only so deep, and it only dwells in the soul. Now, when you understand what I shared earlier, this will make sense. So then there's eros, and eros is the sexual love. It's, it's, it's uh, defined or interpreted as love, but it's almost all only exclusively used in the context of marriage. But what it is, it's sexual love. It's, it's, it's physical. It is the body. It is the body responding to the emotion or the condition of love. But it's only one dimension. And then there's agape. Now, agape is where it's really at. Agape is where we're heading. Agape is love, also quoted, but it's right there out of John 3.16. So we ask ourselves the question, what is love? John 3.16 gives us the real definition. And that is, for God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. Love in the spirit, love to be complete, has to be... Now, I'm going to make a controversial statement here. But I'm going to throw it in there because I'm all in. And that if I don't believe human beings can really love another human being without being born again. I don't think you can truly understand what love is until your spirit is made alive. And you may say, no, I'm not sure about that. Mm, okay. Are you willing to die for the person that you love? Are you willing to give everything for the person you love? How about you've got a child, your only child? Would you give and sacrifice that son or daughter for a person you love? Come on, Pastor David, you're pressing me too far. Well, then it's not really love. Not the biblical kind of, kind of, the biblical kind of love. What really is defined as love? And that is, it's giving without expecting anything in return. A nice little phrase is, with no strings attached. That's what it is. I mean, again, i got to go back to marriage. Coming down the aisle, and it comes down, and it's in the vows. Till death do us part. I prom- I'm giving you every bit of me. It's not at that point that in the, in the vows does anybody say, Unless you, I will love you forever un, unless you fulfill this, this following, following list of, of demands. Here you go, honey. As long as you're meeting that, as long as you look sexy, as long as you're nice, as long as you're kind to me, as long as you do whatever I want you to do, I will be in love with you and I will stay married to you. I know that's making you a little uncomfortable, but folks, this is the reality. It's where we live. And until we inject into it, and I'm not saying sex is bad, and I'm not saying friendship is bad, certainly not in any case. They're designed for their purpose. But once you add on to it the God kind of love, the agape love, the sacrifice, then it all makes sense. Then it pushes past the seasons of life. It pushes past all the different things that that, that can happen, the challenges, all of the different things. That real love pushes us to understand And you say, well, Pastor David, it sounds like to me you're creating a condition where I'm the only one given. Not really. Because if you both believe that, then you're both pouring into the same pot. I'm given all, you're given all. Well, it sounds like to me if she's given all, then your needs are getting met. Are there times when you feel like you're giving a whole lot more, 80% and only 20% on the other 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 side? Yeah. Sometimes you get sick. Sometimes your wife gets pregnant. Sometimes all kinds of different things happen in life. But God says that if we sow with real love, we reap what we sow. We reap what we sow. And if it's all about just my real needs, come on. Does Andrea really meet my every need? No. There's no way she could. There's no way she could. No, it's impossible. She can be my best friend, and she is. 
We've enjoyed all the fruit. We've had five children. We've enjoyed a life together of 31 years, getting ready to be 32. And she's still my best friend. I still love her with all my heart. But can she meet my deepest need? There are times in a marriage when a couple looks at each other and just says, you don't have what I need. And there's only one who can give it to me. And that is my Savior. My wife can't give me true... She can't wipe away my guilt and shame. She can't, wipe, she can't get inside me and make me feel like I've got hope for eternity. She can't do that. Only my Savior can. And when you've got the, what they call the triangle, where it's husband, wife, and God there in heaven, and we connect. The closer we get to him, the closer we get together. The closer we grow together. It just won't happen. So when it comes to understanding what real love is, folks, it expects nothing in return. But see, in this world, we're trained to have our needs met conditionally. But here, here's a great statement that Michael uses in his book that I really believe is something, a bit of a challenge to think about it. And it says this. This is what I would be saying to the person I've chosen to love. I have found a person in you I choose to love and I am determined to demonstrate that love to you by meeting your needs, whether you meet mine or not. Hmm. If we treat our children with conditional love, in other words, I will love you when you obey me. Now, we all get that. and We all know that's wrong. But isn't that what we're doing to the rest of life? That's what we're doing. Matter of fact, some of us do that with God. God, I'll love you, I'll serve you, I'll give you everything of my life as long as you're treating me good, as long as I'm feeling like you're loving me and you're, and you're meeting my needs. And, you're, and, and the, So many people, and I, I would call Christians, who pull away from the church, the church with it because they're disappointed. Disappointed in what? Well, God, because he didn't answer when they wanted, what they wanted, and people. No one said the church was perfect. If anything... It's a university of, of relationship building. We're all learning. We're all growing. And we'll find at the end that we can't really do this. You know, I wrote a paper recently. And you're going to think it's kind of heavy. But I believe it's true based on, on the scriptures. And that is, I don't believe, I believe that almost no one knows how to really be good. Instinctively, none of us really know how to be good. And, and there's two main reasons why this is true. One, because we were born to be selfish. We were born to look out for ourselves. It's called self-preservation. It's instinctive, but then it's also learned over time to the point where people will do the most despicable things to protect themselves. So it's like, I'll be good as long as I'm safe. But the moment the conditions change... In the Old Testament, mothers ate their children. Let that sink in. The other one, the other reason why is because of entitlement. Because society naturally produces people that have and do not have. And because of that entitlement, it begins to create inside us a very, well, of course, it's selfish at its core, but we will drive, we will push. It's not self-preserving, but it's, it's a different motive altogether. And so as a result, as long as I feel like I'm getting the short end of the stick, I am not going to treat you with any goodness whatsoever. As a matter of fact, I'm going to take from you. And I will justify my wicked deeds and call them good. It's scary, isn't it? We got a solution. His name is Jesus. The truth of the matter is none of us knows really how to love one another without our Savior, Jesus. And I love Romans chapter, I think it's five. And it says, and, and, and it really, it just, it's so challenging. Because every one of us says, you know, I'm, I'm basically a good person. I think I'm a loving guy or a gal. I mean, you know, people like me and things like that. Yeah, until the conditions change. But Romans chapter five tells us that the love of God, the thing that will change us and change the world through us, is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. 
That's where you get it. That's the only way you get it. So yes, anybody can have eros love. Anybody can have phileo love. But can anybody have agape love? Only to those who ask. And to only those who give themselves to the one who loves us most. That's really the deal, folks. That's really the, 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 where we really live when it comes to the reality of being able to love people. You know, this translates into what we're doing with our city. You know, it's interesting because we want to love our city. And you may think that's just a gimmick. No, I feel God has really challenged me to say, David, really, really love your city. What does that mean? That means no strings attached. That means we're going to serve our community. We're going to continue to bless it. We're going to love people. And we've all been there. When you come up to somebody and just say, hey, look, can I, can I buy you a lunch? Can I give you something? Can I, I notice you don't have a coat or you, you, she, shoes are kind of worn out. I mean, we're all trying to, and when you do that, what's, what's scary sometimes is people react to that. Because true love is very disarming. People in our world, they don't even know how to handle it. I remember, remember when we went out and gave out the waters. I think it was about a year ago this time. We gave out waters at all those corners around the community. It was amazing. Half the people rejected them. I don't want any water. We look thirsty. It's just water, man, I promise. It's not poisoned. It's free. But people would just look at it and sneer. Because they don't know what to do with genuine kindness. They just don't. And so, you know, we kind of came back together. And what do you do with that? Well, it's what you do with that that is really helps you grow in what was true love. And that is this. That is you come back and just say, you know what? Let's pray for them. Let's pray for them. Because they don't know Jesus yet. They don't know what real love is yet. So what do you do? You keep it on, baby. You're fighting a war of a different kind. You pour it on. And what do you do? When, they, when, they, when, they're, when you make, love, un, make them uncomfortable with love, what do you do? You give them more. And so they finally just say, look, well, you know, we were on the radio recently. It was interesting. Bruce went over there to talk about what we were doing and some things. And I won't mention uh, the individual's name. But a couple of weeks later, this person on the radio said, you know what? I don't know if the, our community is really struggling. And you can't find a lot of people out there that are really loving one another. But doggone it, there's one church in town that's really doing it. And it's Valley Community Church. And I told, you, I, I, I told the staff, I said, I'm done. I can die and go to heaven. When the world starts saying that your church is loving people unconditionally, it's like, slap my face and throw me in the grave. I'm done. <laughs> I mean, this is, this, this is complete. When Christians start to be able to love and walk in what is real love and, and stop all this madness and stop all this comparison and all that and just do what we're called to do. Shut up and do what you're called to do. Love people. Like he loved us. Because here's the other thing. When they reject you and you pray for them, you, you're kind of tempted to get mad. So when they didn't take the water, I mean, hey, I'm human. I wanted to throw it at them. <laughs> Sorry. But I'm just me. I was like, mm, pimp. You know, hit you on the head with it. <laughs> Trying to love you, you idiot. Come on. Anyway, that doesn't work, does it? It doesn't work. I got to admit, it came up in me. But what you do is you go back to the Lord and you just say, Lord, I can't be mad at them. How can I judge them? I know what my sin is. The very fact that that came up inside my heart was proof positive I still need a Savior myself. And the truth of the reality in, in all of this, folks, is, man, we need, we need Jesus. We need him in our marriages. We need him in our friendships. We need him in our workplaces. We need him to love our city. And, 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 and where we get the love, we get it from him. But when I am secure in knowing my sins are forgiven, that I am going to heaven, and I have a Savior who did all that for me, then, man, all I want to do is tell others about it. And if they reject it, well, okay, no problem. I ain't done yet. I ain't done yet. I'm not giving up. You know, we've made this statement before that we're, our job is not done until everyone in this city says, stop telling us about Jesus. We want to go to hell. And that's pretty rough, isn't it? But that's the way it is. As long as there's one last soul out there who's bitter. Maria, Maria Group, are you here? She's got an awesome testimony. She was absolutely diametrically opposed to the church. Hated it. She was serving the enemy. That was her story. But Christians gathered around and just loved her and loved her and loved her and loved her. She told them, go away. They loved her anyway. And so finally, she came to the end of herself, and she knew there was only one place to go, 
And that was to those people <laughs> who loved her so unselfishly. Folks, when it comes to our friendships, when it comes to our marriages, when it comes to raising our children up, we need the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. And you know what the cool thing is? You can get it only by asking. You know, all you have to do is ask him, and he will put it inside you. He will help you love the unlovable. He will let you st- help you stand in a situation where all the emotion's gone, where all the titillation is gone, where all of the endorphins are long gone. He will help you grow in what is true love. And we reap what we sow. When we keep pouring in it, God will take care of every need, sometimes from them, but most time from him. So folks, I want to pray for us today because here we are. We're in this place where we're all challenged. We're all kind of up against the ropes and thinking, well, am I really there? You know, you don't have to be really there. You just need Jesus. And that's the beauty of it. It's very childlike just coming to, Lord, I don't know how to do this thing. I don't know how to be a good husband, a good father. I don't know how to be a good pastor. I don't know how to do it. I'm, I'm learning. I'm, I'm growing. What I need is you, Jesus. And if that's your heart today, I want to pray for you. Let's stand. Thanks for joining our live stream today. Make sure to like our Facebook page. And if you want more information about us, make sure to visit us at our website, valleychurch.us or go and download our Valley Church app called Valley Church Weldon. If you feel led to give today, you can give on our website and on our app.